Well, good afternoon, election fans. This is David Thornburg, President and CEO of the Committee of 70, and welcome to another special edition of Studio C70 on a beautiful October day here in Philadelphia. We're joined today uh, by City Commissioner uh, Al Schmidt, one of three uh, commissioners who are overseeing elections here in Philadelphia. Welcome, Al. It's good to be back uh, with you on Studio 70. Great, great. Well, uh, we're uh, fortunate to have you for a few minutes. I know you and your team are getting ready for uh, another election, uh, but uh, uh, look forward to a chat, doing a little bit, not too much of a retrospective, but uh, getting your take on where things stand right now on a number of uh, election related fronts. But at the risk of incurring a little PTSD, uh, <laughs> I was thinking about what your life was like a year ago would have been about 10 days before the general election. And can you just kind of recreate uh, what that uh, uh, memorable uh, time was like for you and, and for your team uh, circa the third week of October, 2020? Well, so much of what we do uh, to prepare for a busy presidential general election is identical to what we do to prepare for what will be unfortunately, uh, more likely to be a lower turnout um, uh, municipal election. And that is we still have the same number of polling places. We still have the same number of election workers. We still have the same number of voting machines and all the preparation is really the same. There's just a lower volume of voter registration applications to process and a lower volume, unfortunately so far of mail-in ballot applications to process. We are around 100,000 mail-in ballot applications that we've processed this election, as opposed to several hundred thousand in the presidential election of last year. So a lot of that preparation is the same, but it's definitely not as busy. And, it, and, and it, it's not as busy um, for, uh, for a couple of reasons. I mean, the main reason is then the presidential election of last year, our budget included having satellite election offices all over the city to make sure that voters who couldn't vote on election day or chose to vote by mail and ballot could go to a satellite office of the Board of Elections in their general neighborhood or, or part of the city. Uh, and we had a number of those, as you might remember, operational by now and fully, uh, fully staffed up and working, uh, we had, um, I, I think, just the budget allowed us in that presidential election to put on just a, a, a much more, um, to do a lot more outreach and to be even more accessible to voters than we are in this election cycle. Unfortunately, in this election cycle, we only have the Board of Elections office open at City Hall for people to do in-person mail-in voting, meaning that a voter who's registered already can go to the office, they can request a mail-in ballot, they can receive their mail-in ballot, they can, if they choose, vote their mail-in ballot and return it all in one stop shop. Uh, one -stop shop. So this election, we only have one as opposed to last year when we had many. Another, yeah. another reason why it's slightly less difficult this cycle is because we're not under siege. We do not have a concerted uh, effort at the national level through uh, uh, a campaign or its surrogates trying to discredit our election results before a single vote is cast. But that doesn't mean it's not an important election. We have yep. a seat on the Supreme Court on the ballot, so, you know, uh, all levels of court from Supreme Court to municipal court. So uh, in addition to DA and controller. So it's an important election cycle for, for all of us. Sure. More on that in a minute, as they say. Uh, but, you know, I know, uh, last year uh, was trying for you and your team. I know you've spoken out in national media about the threats that you and your family and your team received. I mean, it was a very, very trying circumstances. But for just a moment, I, I want you there. So there's been a lot of attention on the, uh, on the, the, the stress and the frustration and so forth on last year. But <clears throat> Maybe asking a question that hasn't been, hasn't been asked to you before. What was the best thing? What was, was there a moment in last year's election that you will always remember um, 
for positive reasons, not because uh, you were in the um, in the rugby scrum of uh, uh, of the political push and pull. But what were, what were you most proud of um, uh, in the 2020 election cycle? Um, just broadly, I'm I'm proud of. Uh, of uh, the people who work in our department and throughout the city government who made that election possible. I'm proud of the assistance of Committee of 70 in promoting that election and voter education and all the work uh, that, that you all did um, uh, on a personal level and professional level was obviously very, very difficult for, for all of us who uh, run elections. I, I would guess there are, um, there are a couple things. I mean, uh, for me, um, at one point, my my son's birthday is uh, November sixth, um, and my wife brought him and the other kids by uh, the Pennsylvania Convention Center so I could sneak out back and see them. And they were also all uh, all dressed up with you know signs reading "Count Every Vote." count the votes uh, it, it, and, and it was unrelated to what I was doing in the end. I mean, it was related to it, but like I wasn't like putting them up to it or something like that. Uh, but it was it was great to see, um, you know, my little kids that um, enthusiastic and engaged and, and, you know, in a very difficult time to sneak out of the back loading dock of the convention center and I, uh, give them a hug. That's um, great. I, I suspect you weren't seeing much of them at that point. Uh, I was not, and uh, most of the attention we were getting was, you know, aggressive and trying to keep us from doing our job, not encouraging us to, to do our job. Yeah. Uh, and also for us, it's really never about the outcome. It's never about who wins and who lo loses or by how much. Um, uh, but it was uh, with all the efforts to try to prevent us from counting our voters votes in Philadelphia, to slow that process down, to discredit it and all the rest. Um, uh, another high point was that the election was called due to, um, due to an update from Philadelphia uh, in our election results that caused CNN to call the election, which caused everyone else to call the election. At that point, it was already very clear. I mean, the truth exists in those ballots, right? We just have to count those ballots and bring them to light. So the election was already done. Everyone had already cast their vote. It was just a matter of us sort of counting them and processing it all quickly enough while there were these efforts to try to stop us or slow us or discredit those results. Yeah. So I think Philadelphia's contribution to um, to resulting in the election being called, uh, regardless of how it's called, was was gratifying on some yeah. level. Certainly, all eyes were on you and your colleagues and us. Uh, as I'm remembering, it was about eleven seventeen or eleven twenty three or something like that on that Saturday morning uh, after the election. So it, it yeah. was minutes before um, Rudy Giuliani was about to hold a press conference at that landscaping company. Um, uh, in, I think, Southwest Philly to call for, you know, our voters' votes to not be counted. Um, yeah. So uh, Which we ended we, up stepping on that. We should probably do a whole Studio C70 interview with the Four Seasons Soto Landscaping crew who <laughs> have done a masterful job of capitalizing on their 15 minutes of fame. Apparently, <laughs> there's a documentary coming out about them. Um, in addition to the fact they're hosting punk punk rock music concerts up there, so well, good for them. <laughs> that's, a, that's a that's a very Philly response to you know the, your time in the limelight. So I suspect you, and I know I I thought and assumed that uh, the uh, tempers would uh, would cool shortly after the election would call, and we'd get on with the business of governing. That wasn't exactly the case, and we're still dealing with the ripple effects uh, of that election and all the claims, uh, false claims that emerged from that election. So two things I wanna to talk to you about. First of all, is what's your, as a on the ground election administrator, 
What is your take on uh, or update on what's coming out of Harrisburg that is at least in, in by name having something to do with improving the way we run elections? Um, how do you how do you sort through the 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 noise and the static? You know, from from um, sort of my parochial perspective, there have been uh, a number of um, initiatives or, or legislation coming out of Harrisburg that would improve um, elections in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and a lot that would not, and would ultimately result in voters being disenfranchised. Uh, for no good reason, assuming there is even a good reason that could possibly be um, imagined. So, uh, and, and it's all sort of bundled together. The, the good and the bad and the ugly is all in one legislative package. So we've done our best to, we testified in front of the House in Harrisburg and the Senate in Harrisburg. And I think, I think 70 has as well to advocate for different ways that would uh, improve access for voters without in any way uh, jeopardizing or harming the, the integrity of the electoral process. Uh, and a couple of those things involve allowing election boards to begin processing mail-in ballot envelopes earlier than 7 a.m. on election day. So a lot of states, as you know, have significant mail-in ballot voting, like Florida, um, but they can do all this work prior to election day and then count the votes on election day and report by midnight that night, hundreds of thousands of votes that they received. Uh, we're not allowed to do that. We can't begin doing that until 7 a.m. on election morning, which results in uh, uh, votes being counted four days after the election, even though they're cast on or before election day. And that creates an opportunity, I think, to exploit um, exploit in that in that period of time, uh, and try to undermine uh, in, uh, the the confidence in the electoral process because people are used to knowing results on election night, or used to think they know when the results what the results are on election night, um, not days later. So yeah. we have a new system of voting. It changes the whole reporting process, and and one of the most important changes would allow us to report results more quickly. Um, on election yeah. day itself, rather than two or three or four days later. Yeah, and, and we've been in full support of that, but uh, even that seemingly small change has been difficult to achieve. One of our concerns right now, and I'd be interested if it's concerning to you, is that all of the reporting about various bills and hearings and lawsuits and so forth at the state level seems to leave voters confused about what, if anything, actually has changed for this election. So i uh, give you a chance to talk to voters and say, well, what has changed from a voter's perspective as we near the November election, if anything? Um, legislatively, there hasn't really been any activity that affects uh, any of it. There was the big change, which was uh, the introduction of mail-in voting in the Commonwealth uh, that was passed at the end of 2019, first implemented in the primary of 2020, and then the high turnout election of general 2020. So that was, I think, all new. And there was also legislation that changed the process a little bit between the primary and the general. So a lot of changes going on, which creates some uncertainty because it's a whole new system. Uh, and then after that, um, both th there were both efforts to improve elections from sort of lessons learned in that process and efforts to um, respectfully um, make it harder for voters to vote with no added uh, uh, security to the uh, integrity of elections at all. Uh, and uh, sort of like what I mentioned before, all that gets bundled together in one big package, which makes it hard to get anything done. As you know, we have a divided government in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We have a Republican House and a Republican Senate and a Democratic governor. Uh, so things have, I think, sort of stalemated there for now, but I'm hopeful we'll, we'll get some of these common sense improvements that are supported in big counties and small counties 
supported by Republicans and Democrats uh, done to improve the voter experience. Right. But just to be clear, because this is, you know, some of the confusion we hear, the, the, I'll say the, the basic building blocks uh, of, uh, that were in place for last November are still in place for this November. You can vote in person. You can vote by mail. You still have drop boxes, although not as many as, as we had uh, uh, last November. You mentioned earlier that we don't have satellite election offices all over the city and that your office in City Hall is functioning as that satellite uh, office. So, so just to reassure folks, the core elements of, of how we vote and, and uh, are, are in place. Um, and we can talk later about how they confirm that, and, you know, your website, our website and so forth. But, yeah. but nothing, let's just say as the lawyers and accountants say, nothing material has changed. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, it, it, we, we have fewer resources that we can deploy like satellite offices around the board of elections offices around the city or other things like that. We do have, and you can find them um, on our website, all of the drop boxes, which are 24 seven secure and monitored around the city. We'll also be doing a series of uh, mobile mail-in ballot drop-offs around the city to try to hit some of those locations where there aren't drop boxes immediately nearby. And they increase in importance the closer we get to election day. Um, uh, voters may have already applied for a ballot, may have already received the ballot, but the closer you get to election day, the less likely it is that we'll have their ballot back in our hands by 8 p.m. on election night. And we have to have that ballot back in our hands by 8 p.m. on election night. So drop boxes and, and other ways to return it become increasingly valuable the closer you get. Um, because if you wait until the deadline, which is on Tuesday, and I would not wait until the deadline on Tuesday, but if you wait until the deadline on Tuesday to apply, even if on our end, we can turn that mail-in ballot application around and mail one back to you in 24 hours after we receive it, it still takes a day or two to get to you. You still have to complete it. You still have to yeah. mail it back. And there's a very real chance that because of the timing of it all, um, uh, your ballot arrives after election day, in which case it won't be counted. So that's why drop mail-in ballot drop boxes are, are, are very helpful to this process. Well, and that was another uh, proposal uh, that uh, a practical proposal that was part of the legislation you mentioned that also hasn't uh, hasn't moved forward. But uh, on mail ballots, which today is uh, the 21st of October, for practical purposes, if people uh, uh, have a mail ballot, what would you suggest is the last day they should stick it in a, uh, a regular post box? Or even now, would you suggest uh, to use a, a drop box? You know, that's, it's, it's a very difficult question to answer. We're, we're, at, at, we're grateful for all the work the Postal Service does in delivering all these ballots back and forth. But I know we mail things out that arrive the next day. Uh, and also that we mail ballots out that arrive some days, some days later. But um, I think most importantly, people shouldn't wait until the last minute to apply if you're going to vote by mail-in ballot. And the closer you get to election day, the more you should consider dropping one off at our Dropbox locations. And those Dropbox locations uh, have you returning our ballot directly to us as opposed to you putting in a mailbox to come back to us. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just takes a little bit longer. So as you get closer to election day, the more you should consider identifying a drop box near you to return the ballot uh, yeah. to us. You can cut, cut out the middleman as it were, if the post office were functioning as a middleman. That's right. So put all of that together, you know, here comes an election, the swirling, uh, noise around election reform, election security, uh, the persistence of what some folks have called the big lie. Um, you know, we, we're in a time, I won't be the first or the last to point out, uh, where misinformation is a real threat. 
um, misinformation born of confusion and uh, people finding it hard to kind of uh, follow the, the bouncing ball of legislation and discussion and conversation and endless commentary. Do you have a, in your head, sort of a, a suggestion again to voters that um, helps shield them from, that <clears throat> might help shield them from misinformation? Like how, because we're all surrounded by it. How, how do you, how would you advise uh, voters to um, uh, kind of uh, follow the, the right line as it were in, in the voting process? I, I you know, typically uh, the truth is the best antidote to lies. Um, but frankly, and unfortunately it has only met with so much, um, so much success uh, in the in the last in the last year or so, when there's been this concerted effort to spread disinformation and an effort to undermine our electoral process and confidence in confidence in it, I would say most of all it's for voters to turn to sources that they trust, sources that everyone trusts, sources that are reputable, like Committee of Seventy and others. Um, that don't have a dog in the fight. It's not about who wins and who loses. It's about sharing accurate information without uh, propaganda that is tr trying to support a candidate or hurt a candidate or um, or so distrust in our electoral process. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I'm sure you feel sometimes like you're beating your head against a wall, and I I do too because there is just so much misinformation out there. It is so widespread. I don't, you know, personally think it's gotten better since the 2020 general election. In, in fact, it may have gotten worse or sort of settled in. Uh, I would have thought that what people saw on January 6 would have sort of shaken people out of this, like a little bit of a reality check. I haven't really seen that other than the 24 or 48 hours after January 6. So it's frustrating, but we have no other choice. I mean, it's it's really about, you know, your at 70 and others as well, just sort of spreading the truth here and spreading information to voters so that, it, that it, it's accurate and they have confidence that their vote counts and will be counted. Yep. Well, you mentioned something which is sort of part of our advice, uh, package of advice, which is you, you should always consider the source. Where is this news coming from? And if someone, your neighbor shares some bit of news with you, even asking that question of him or her, where is this coming from? And as you said, do they have a dog in the fight? Right. <laughs> because and you should be highly suspect of information that comes from somebody who's leaning in on one candidate or the other. Yes. And if your source is telling you that truckloads of counterfeit Chinese ballots are being smuggled into Philadelphia by organized crime figures to do this, that, or the other thing. I mean, you wouldn't believe it if you saw it in a movie. You'd probably walk out. It's so stupid. But um, but this sort of thing gets spread around. And I, and, and I think what's, what's uh, a bigger problem, and probably, frankly, above, um, above our pay grade, is, you know, the, 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 the previous, the former president didn't sort of create all of this. He did in some ways exploit it. There was already something there that made voters receptive to all this misinformation and disinformation um, that, um, that then um, allowed it to spread and, and, and kind of take root. And that's, that's, that's really a disturbing thing. It's really something, uh, you know, we can do what we can, but that's a bigger issue that I think we need to um, to have uh, to get to the bottom of. Yeah. Well, as I said a minute ago, our, our response is often to uh, to ask questions uh, when you're confronted with something that just doesn't sound right. <laughs> and uh, and that right. could be a helpful way of kind of getting closer to the truth. Uh, just wanted to just ask you one more uh, uh, sort of uh, focus on one last set of issues. You mentioned earlier that um, whether it's a presidential election or 
I've always resented the off year elections when someone talks about it's an off year. It's for folks like you, it's always an on year. <laughs> for people who are running, it's always an on year. So, uh, you know, they resent that as well. But, but you have to prepare the same way for this election as you did for the presidential election. I was saying to you before we went on that you can't, you know, set a table up for six and then have 10 people show up. You have to have you have to set the table for ten, even if you past experience suggests that, and that's an important thing for people to remember. It's it's not your your work doesn't rise and fall depending on the anticipated volume because I suspect you like me, you think I think a hundred percent of voters are going to come out this year. <laughs> so um, just use that as a give us some sense of of what your office is up to now leading up to the election, and then maybe uh, close with some, some of the basics of where people can turn if they have further questions about how they vote leading up to the election that's uh, uh, coming up soon. Yeah, to, to speak the, to the issue that you raise, um, there, there's almost uh, perversity in the sense that uh, offices that we elect that are closer to home, the ones that affect us on an everyday level, whether it's district attorney or city controller or, or a judge in a courtroom or something like that. Those are the ones, though they are up for election when there's the least, uh, there's the least turnout. Presidential election, things like that that get the biggest sort of national attention um, are most likely the ones that affect us on an everyday level the least. So strangely, the, the closer it is to home, the less likely people are to participate. And I think one reason why participation is low is that typically turnout is driven um, uh, right now, especially no disrespect to Tip O'Neill, but by national level issues, not just uh, all things being local. And um, uh, uh, that, um, uh, I, I lost my, my train of thought. Um, the oh, national competition. I'm sorry, competition. That that we we have a very imbalanced political ecosystem in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is more than seven to one Democratic to Republican. We frequently don't have um, uh, Democratic candidates challenged or Democratic candidates having an, an opponent at all. And normally, when there's less competition, there's there's less voter participation. So I think those things sort of add to that. You know, we spent a lot of this conversation talking about mail and ballot voting. And it's extraordinary that we've gone from zero to about half of our voters. But that also means about half of our voters are going to vote on election day on Tuesday at 1,703 um, election boards around the city, hopefully in your neighborhood. If not, down the street it might be a couple blocks away for wheelchair accessibility or other reasons. But half of our voters are going to vote on on Tuesday, and the preparation that we put into that is the same whether it's a high turnout or low turnout election. Different elections face different challenges, or we face different challenges in different elections. Uh, presidential election last year, it might be processing an incredible number of mail in ballot applications, or a whole lot of people showing up on election day. On these in this election cycle, I don't want to say off your elections, but in, in the election cycle where it's some judicial offices, DA and controller, where there is traditionally lower turnout, one of the problems we face is not enough people working at the polls. In a presidential election, people know what when election day is, they're all excited about it, they're happy to participate in the process um, and work for 13 or 14 hours to make democracy happen uh, at the local level. But in these elections, there's a lot less interest by people to work on election boards. So I just, if you don't mind me sort of just generally in closing, kind of plug that is if you go to our website, PhiladelphiaVotes.com, you'll, you'll see uh, an opportunity for serving on election board. Um, to put your name in. So our election board unit will give you a call and see if there's a vacancy in your neighborhood um, so that you can serve. And on election day, the most important people in the city, it's not you, David, 
and it's not me. It's the person down the street working on election board for a long time for very little money to make sure that you're able to cast your vote. Um, so if you have any interest in serving on election day on November 2nd, you should, you should consider it and, and we'd be grateful for your service. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I did my time several cycles back when we first moved to Germantown. I remember showing up at 6.30 in the morning and finishing at nine o'clock at night. And there's a long period of, let's just call it boredom. But the good news is you get to know people in your neighborhood, you get to know your election workers, and, and you feel like you're doing something really important. Uh, if, 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 if voting is sort of the entry point to democracy, this is like the uh, advanced course, you know, that, that you're responsible for the process, not just your individual vote. So couldn't agree. Yeah, and it might be a curious thing to, to suggest, but the more you know about elections, the more likely, uh, the more educated you are about them, the more likely you are to trust the outcome because you're not believing in all sorts of nonsense. And I think you'll find that on election boards. They know what goes into all this. They know there aren't, you know, like bus loads of uh, people coming over from Camden shuttled in by I don't know, space aliens or whoever. Like they, the, you, you, the more you know about this, the more you are to trust the process because you, because you know about the checks and balances and everything that are put into place uh, to make sure that, um, that elections are run smoothly and with integrity. Absolutely. And sometimes I think we, this whole debate would have been quite different if, if we res restricted the participation in that debate to those folks who had actually worked in an election. <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of people have said a lot of stuff who have no idea uh, what actually goes on on the ground. So, or, or I'm sorry to get a little edgy, but or people who write laws about <laughs> about the elect that that govern elections who who. Um, would benefit from more education about them. Well, there is that too. So uh, lots of work to be done. Uh, good luck between now and election day to you and your team. And thanks for uh, joining us again today on Studio C70. Thank you, David. All right, see you soon.